Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I was just speaking without having myself unmuted, which is always um, an interesting thing, right? I mean, that happen happens to many people. So um, good morning and good afternoon in the Netherlands and uh, uh, welcome to this fireside chat about smart cities and smart city tools and uh, yeah, the nexus between the LA 2028 games. Uh, my name is Jan Top and I work for the uh, Netherlands Consulate General in San Francisco. And I, I'm thrilled and happy to be your host and moderator today. Um, as I said, I work for the Netherlands Consulate General and the Netherlands Consulate General is the official representation of the Dutch Kingdom in, on the US West Coast. I'm part of the economic team of, uh, of, the, of the consulate and the economic team stimulates the exchange and the trade between the Netherlands and California. Uh, I'm personally uh, specifically focus, focusing on topics such as water, uh, transportation, and the built environment. And I am trying to facilitate and stimulate the conversation between experts on, on, on these topics uh, on both sides of, of the ocean. And today we're going to talk about smart cities, smart city approaches, smart city tools in nexus to the hosting of uh, major events such as the LA 2028 Games. Um, and this fireside chat, the so-called fireside chat, is a uh, part of a three-day virtual exchange uh, between the city of Los Angeles and the Netherlands to, to discuss sports and sports-related processes in, in, uh, in anticipation of the hosting of the LA 2028 Games, the Olympic Games. And uh, we regard this virtual exchange as a kickoff of a continuous conversation between both areas, um, uh, yeah, the Netherlands and, and, and LA. And uh, yeah, we hope, hopefully are uh, being able to work towards a fruitful collaboration uh, between the Netherlands and LA uh, in order to work and host uh, uh, and, and create like the smartest and the most sustainable um, Olympic games ever held. And uh, this is relevant for like the, the upcoming games, right? But um, uh, as you might've heard yesterday and a lot of people already know is that the Netherlands is also entertaining the idea to uh, uh, submit a bid for the 2032 games. Uh, so this might be the kickoff of something uh, way uh, uh, longer and, 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 and a way longer like sustainable relationship between uh, the Netherlands and LA uh, and, and, and California in general. Um, as said today, we're going to talk about the smart city topics and we believe that smart city tools and smart city topics uh, do really help to, um, yeah, uh, to, to create a, 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 a more efficient and, and really help to uh, prepare for the uh, organization and the hosting of such big games as the Olympic Games in uh, in uh, being held in LA in 2028. Um, yesterday was also mentioned by, uh, for example, Casey Wasserman from the LA 2028 organization that LA is actually ready to host the games tomorrow uh, because all the venues are there. But um, um, uh, its its focus is just to also create a more healthy a more sustainable city and a, a more livable city uh, um, um, in 2028 uh, um, compared to what it is right now. So that is actually the focus of LA uh, for the coming eight years. Um, we are thrilled to have to having like three di different aspects, uh, experts today uh, to talk about these different topics. And we're having uh, the chief data officer from the city of LA to elaborate a little bit on the uh, smart city approach of the city of LA. We're having Leonie van der Beuken, she's working with the smart city uh, 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 program in Amsterdam. And we're having Dennis Rodriguez from uh, Siemens, who is uh, working on, uh, he's actually the head of external affairs of Siemens uh, in the US, but he's also um, um, involved with like a lot of uh, uh, sustainable uh, and uh, smart city topics, um, especially in connection with uh, infrastructure. Um, so the following 40 minutes um, uh, is uh, uh, about like uh, these three different experts giving a short statement about their respective expertise. And we're concluding with a 15 minute to 10 to 15 minute exchange and discussion uh, between the different experts, but also um, with you uh, in the audience. Um, and I'd like to encourage you in the audience to, yeah, to ask your questions in the chat, but also uh, if you have uh, room and time, to unmute yourself and ask your uh, ask your question just live, um, and although you might be less familiar with, for example, smart city tools, I believe what we have in common is that we all want to create and, and work and help to collaborate on creating these most uh, uh, sustainable and smartest games ever. And um, 
yeah, your expertise could actually be and serve as input for like uh, the creation of smart city tools. Um, maybe one last thing I'd like to mention, and, and then I'd like to introduce uh, Jean Holm and, and give her the floor to give her statement, is that the different participants here today have quite a, a diverse uh, expertise. We ex especially selected these different uh, participants um, yeah, uh, because of that, that diverse expertise. So we're having uh, uh, organizations and companies focusing on, on, on sports, such as the, uh, uh, the, the, the Dutch Olympic Com Committee, uh, the baseball and softball uh, um, committee. We're also having companies more focusing on the manufacturing of lighting, uh, the manufacturing of steel, uh, um, um, uh, com uh, companies who are like more involved with uh, the organizing cir circular events. So. Yeah, it's quite a diverse group and I'd like to encourage you to, uh, uh, yeah, to put your questions and to put your comments and remarks in the chat. Uh, having said that, I'd like to introduce our first uh, panelist. Her name is Jean Holm. She's working with the City of LA as Chief Data Officer and she's also the technical advisor, the tech advisor to the mayor of the City of Los Angeles. Uh, Jean is working on creating innovative data-driven solutions for the city addressing issues ranging from homelessness, dig digital inclusion, improving city services, and um, yeah, ensuring that businesses and residents have the data they need. And I asked uh, uh, Jean uh, during our prep call to inform us a little bit about the LA Smart City approach and how that affects the shaping of the future city, especially in Nexus with the uh, hosting of the LA 2028 Games. So Jean, I'd like to uh, give you the floor and uh, yeah, lead us through your presentation and uh, yeah, um, uh, and, and your uh, perspective on smart city approaches. Thank Great, you. and thank you so much. And it's an honor to be here. I, uh, I am so encouraged by your consideration of the bid for the 32 games and, uh, and we'll share a little bit about what we're doing around smart cities. I think it's, a, it's an interesting time to be talking about uh, the future when we're very much uh, embroiled in issues around the present. But, um, but I am an eternally optimistic person and will uh, and I want to talk about the fact that even while we work today to manage the pandemic and the recession and racial justice that we are also planning uh, for the future. So I'm just going to share a few ideas about some of the things that we've noticed in working with the Olympic Committee for Los Angeles that are areas that really connect smart cities with what we're doing today. So just give me a moment. So in Los Angeles, um, we're really looking at how we do this work in a way that engages a lot of people and also builds the infrastructure today that we'll be needing tomorrow. And as part of that, we are doing a variety of different kinds of smart city technologies. And I won't talk about all of these, but if you are interested in any of these, um, I'm sure some of these other speakers will also touch on it. I'm happy to follow up, but I will touch on a few that I think are particularly pertinent to the way in which we're looking at a future, you know, several years from now and how we're trying to do things differently with information and data today and technology as it's kind of emerging. And also to understand that we're doing this in the context of, of inequity, right? So in all cities, we have inequity. Uh, Los Angeles is no exception. And so we're working with a large homeless population while we're working with some of the wealthiest people on the planet. And so, so how we create a city that serves all of those people in a diverse way and across 220 languages spoken in the city becomes part of our ongoing challenge. So just to, to put a point in time, we are doing quite a bit related to the coronavirus um, in Los Angeles with predictive analytics, uh, understanding sentiment analysis, which I think is something we'll continue to do forward um, as we also are working on other initiatives and including the Olympics, which is understanding how people are feeling and speaking in social media as a way of understanding um, kind of that global pulse of what's going on in Los Angeles. And this has been super helpful in being able to, as the mayor gives press conferences, to understand in, in the immediate space, but also in the days after how compliant people are going to be with certain things. In a positive way, it also lets us think if we want to uh, encourage people to explore the city while they're here for the Olympics, or if we want to encourage them to do certain behaviors or engage in certain sports activities, you know, what is the messaging and how can we do that in a way which um, compels people to have behaviors that we think are healthier. 
A few of the specific things that we've talked with the Olympic Committee about that are um, very different, that are going to be very different, but I don't think everybody realized this at first. We originally started talking about traditional parking and people getting to and from a venue, like just some of the logistical infrastructure around getting people into the city, out to their venues, uh, engaging in those activities, discussing those activities and kind of having the Olympic experience. We also really uh, tried to make sure everybody understood that transportation is radically changing in the next few years. So the advent of autonomous vehicles, which we are piloting here in Los Angeles and autonomous airborne vehicles, uh, which we're also piloting are things that are really gonna be shaping differently the experience that people have in coming to the city, how they move around and the safety in which they do that. And then the construction uh, at a venue of how we don't necessarily expect people to park in a lot and walk, but we may expect more places for autonomous drop off and then remote parking. We also are really interested in engaging people in, maybe not today when we're asking them to stay at home for COVID, but in a general sense, the idea of exploration. So, so we are currently doing work with augmented reality and virtual reality experiences that help to guide people to different spaces around the city, depending on what their interests are. So we have, uh, this is a, a program, the specific one on this slide is a program for children and families that helps them explore parks and open spaces. Um, um, kind of with the augmented reality Pokemon Go, sort of virtual catch the catch the mountain lion virtually, virtually catch the mountain lion. Um, but but this gives us a platform to build on as we move forward towards wanting with a large influx of folks coming in for the Olympics and other things that we just want to make sure we're having people uh, explore other aspects of the city. So not just to come and do one experience, but to have the experience of being throughout Los Angeles. So the work we're doing now with AR and VR really helps lead us towards uh, towards the way in which we can explore and help people uh, have not just the one experience, but a whole variety of experiences around an event. The other thing that came up for us actually related to COVID, but is something that's going to be quite exciting is we're moving to a one city uh, identity card called the Angelino card. We did this in a quick effort to get um, basic help and information and income uh, support and assistance out to people during the pandemic. But we're building an entire infrastructure for contactless government and digital transformation of services so that people would be able to, with one card, get on any of a whole variety of transit options, be able to uh, use that to interact with any city service, um, be able to use that to interact with um, other venues around the city. So this will be in place, well, it's in place to a certain extent right now for about 56,000 of our businesses. And we're growing this card so that will have a much more seamless experience for people as they come and be able to help folks with, uh, with issues around being able to pay for different, different items. And then just a couple more points. There are also technologies that we're using around public safety that I think are part and parcel of how we manage a smart city. Um, as we think about, uh, for example, one of the normal natural disasters we get in Los Angeles are earthquakes. We were the first city uh, to develop an early earthquake warning system. So this actually, ShakeAlert LA is an app that gives you an alert before you feel the shaking of an earthquake. There's a lot of technology behind it, but the bottom line is that you have advanced warning and it really makes it so that people who might be concerned about different kinds of uh, public safety issues or natural disasters know that they are um, going to be accommodated and will know in advance, even for ones that are as quick as an earthquake. And we are also doing work, um, this is a particular interest around the sustainability issue for air quality. Um, Los Angeles has sometimes the best air quality, sometimes the worst. We vary a lot because of a variety of geographies, but we have a large NASA grant in order to be able to do predictive analytics and change our city policies so that as athletes come here, whether it's just for a game or for the games, that they are able to uh, compete to the top of their ability because we are working very hard to have um, a very act lot of activity around environmental justice and air quality. And Mayor Garcetti leads the C40 cities that, um, working on this effort together. You'll be hearing from other folks this week, I think around the sustainable development goals, but we use that as a framework in the city um, and how we look forward and really the focus on equity. So I started, as I started, I talked about the inequities in Los Angeles. We are working very closely 
with a variety of local governments, institutions, and community organizations to really drive into the analysis of our work around the sustainable development goals and use that as a framework as we move forward. So as we think about it, we're really looking at our work towards the Olympics as a, as a driver to motivate city departments and others to really focus in on making radical changes in transportation experience of the city, equity, safety, and the environment. So our smart city is very focused on making it a livable city. Thanks. Thank you, Gina. It was a very um, informative presentation and I'm personally very curious about, okay, what is then the, because uh, you, were, you were talking about like stimulating different, different departments in the city to improve and, 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 and work with the like, smart city tools and, and working towards like creating a more healthy city. And uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to know about like what, what are like the best partnerships, what are your tips and tops with regard to like good partnerships or yeah, maybe bad or less workable partnerships, but let's, let's talk about it later during the discussion. Um, our next panelist is Leonie van der Beuken and she's working with the uh, Amsterdam Smart City uh, program. She's the program director there. And uh, Leonie has a tradition in managing spatial planning and project management uh, 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 projects. Um, she's facilitating and, uh, and accelerating sustainable solutions through her program. And um, Amsterdam Smart City, and, and probably Eleni is gonna elaborate on that a little bit as well, is an innovation platform accelerating transitions in order to create a livable metropolitan region. Um, and they're working with the so-called quad quadruple, it's a difficult word to pronounce, quadruple helix, which, uh, which, is, which are governments, uh, so public organizations, uh, uh, um, uh, research institutes, nonprofit foundations and organizations, but also uh, uh, yeah, private, private equities and private uh, 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 parties. Um, Leonie is going to elaborate on what it means to be a livable and healthy city and how that is to be achieved in the realm of smart cities. Um, yeah, and then in specific, uh, the, uh, the situation in Amsterdam. So Leonie, uh, the floor is yours. I was muted still. Thank you so much, Jan, for the introduction. And thank you so much all uh, for having me here. It's really a delight. I have quite a lot of slides with me. So uh, if you bear with me, I'm going to do high speed. Because uh, we're indeed about creating livable cities uh, uh, all over the world. Um, and we're an open space, a safe space, a fun space for cooperation, innovation, being independent. Because we strongly believe change makers need this independent place where they can meet and interact and share ideas and speed up. Um, and this is how we look like. We have this partnership within uh, the region of the Amsterdam Metropolitan Region, uh, about 20 partners right now, but we're connected uh, with an inter huge international community like yourselves, people from all over the world. And again, we're doing so um, to work together. So not only networking, but even sharing knowledge. And also these 20 partners within our region are actually collaborating with each other uh, and like you said, this quadruple helix is what we do is make the best of all the differences we have. So to put uh, everyone's strength uh, at the core and everyone's imperfections, uh, to recognize your own imperfection and, and allowing you to be helped by others. So we strongly believe that we're, with this co cooperation, we can have better uh, innovations. We're not about creating smart cities, but much more about wise regions. And these regions, how do they look like? Uh, well, to boost uh, transitions and make them tangible and likable and accessible uh, for people. So we focus on these four uh, transitions, uh, boosting them with the help of uh, technology. Um, we don't have uh, very clear goals. We uh, specifically decided not to make manifestos and have these very clear goals where then we should um, talk for months or maybe years with 20 partners before we have set in stone what we would like to approach. But what we do have are these values. And these for us are at the core of what we're doing. So how to move from smart city to wide city uh, to be really helpful and, and, and have real meaningful innovations for us, these values are at the core. And I'm using them in the next slides uh, for mobility with this 
uh, events embedded in cities. Uh, so how do these values look uh, when we have these events? Well, one of our most important, uh, and like Jean already said, we have to be human-centered for all. So even for homeless, the very rich, and everything, everyone in between. So when you are working human-centered, it means that every innovation you have is understandable, accessible, affordable, trustworthy for every sort of type of people. And we use this quadruple helix and mostly our societal organizations to help commercial and public government to, to connect with citizens and entrepreneurs to have this human-centered approach. It's always important to have public value, even so in, in smart technology, because when you use your phone, it uses a lot of um, scarce materials. Uh, it should be a waste if we use these scarce materials only to click out the lights. So it has to have real public value. Um, and, and for this, it means safe traveling, less congestion, less pollution, and respecting everyone using around uh, this venue. It means responsible digitalization. So uh, all the use of data, censoring, uh, lightning, and so forth. Uh, we can have this in place, but it needs to be transparent uh, algorithm. It needs to be fair uh, algorithms. It needs to be respectful with privacy, but also respectful with um, uh, autonomy. Uh, you can nudge people, but uh, I still want to have some free choice. Uh, so this for us is very important that people still have a choice what to do, not being managed by data. And the last one for us, very important, is continuous le learning. Uh, so I've put up some great events, uh, which all are, everyone is in, in, inventing something, uh, learning something, has some failures, and we make sure that all these learnings uh, can be uh, applied into the next uh, uh, venue. So LA 2028 and so forth. So how does it look like? I started with uh, SIL uh, 2015, had 2.3 million people in only five days. And this was the first time uh, when I started uh, with all the censoring, uh, with this flow chart, trying to get a grip on where people are, what they were about to do, and whether they should be uh, uh, managing the crowd or that they just could uh, lay back. Uh, they learned a lot and whatever they learned, they applied later on the central station and to um, the Kalverstraat, the shop, shopping street. So now we have this matrix signs uh, telling people not to go or to move different way or speed up or stuff like that. And we use social media as well. So lots has been applied over there. We have the Rye, which is uh, a venue, a huge venue. Uh, when it came over there, it was at the really end of the city, uh, at, the, at the outskirts of the city, but now you can see it's really built into the city. So whatever the ride does, is 1.6 million visitors need, get a lot of trucks and lots of people, and they need to take into account all these citizens uh, uh, living around. So what they do is, of course, stimulate public transport, have this extra parking lots, but now what they are doing, and Johan Cryferina participated already, so I do not talk about a lot about them, but using all the insights with the Johan Cryferina had and using this mobility portal, where different uh, agencies are combining their data, sharing their data, so we can help people spread around and nudge them to the right place. And the next one is still to come. Uh, Floriade and like, uh, LA is aiming for uh, creating a legacy social floriade. So they're going to have a use of existing infra, but in a very different way, uh, maybe a coloring as uh, a stroke, so only for uh, targeted, uh, targeted groups, uh, but also use of data, sensors, and so forth. And they have a huge problem in nitro oxygen, so they really need to have less transport, at least uh, electrical transport, because uh, if not, they will not get the, the, the permit even uh, for their uh, venue. Then uh, a few more slides I have. What for us at Amsterdam Smart City is very important. You can do crowd control and being a government, but it's also very nice to have crowd support. And I hope you can see the right side. So uh, people making use uh, of all the data governments are uh, collecting and making them uh, available for 
just a citizen. So they can make an informed decision where to go and how to go. So not only governments, but citizens themselves. And these are some other uh, examples, like on the right side, a bubble when you can know I'm too close to someone. On the left side, uh, public transport telling you where to go. And the last, uh, this is the Jan Cruijff Arena example I'm going to share with you, is this public eye monitor, creating an open source crowd monitoring toolkit, which is ethical, open and effective. Uh, so it uses cameras on location processors and then has this public dashboard where you can really see what's happening. Uh, and this knowledge again is shared with the crowd. So it's not only the government controlling or the venue controlling the masters, but the masters controlling themselves. Uh, so this is in a very nut nutshell what we are doing and how we try to share uh, the knowledge. And these are all not my project, only the projects of my partners. So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank, uh, thank you, Lainey, and we definitely get back to you. And it's so interesting to, to yeah, to understand like also the, the the similarities between what Jean was talking right and 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 also the differences and the different examples you guys were both mentioning. Uh, you already mentioned like the, the, that both programs are really uh, focused on the human, human centered, and I think that's definitely an, an yeah a very important uh, important aspect of being human centered and also. Uh, using uh, smart city tools to the advantage of like the residents and visitors of, of certain cities. Um, and you also mentioned, for example, the responsible digitalization. I know that in our prep talk, we were talking about like the challenges with regard to dig digitalization and also the privacy issues. Maybe you could uh, elaborate a little bit on that later on. Uh, but before we do that, we're gonna, I'm gonna, going to introduce our next panelist, which is uh, Dennis Rodriguez, and he's the head of external affairs uh, with Siemens. Uh, uh, he's based and located in Los Angeles, and he oversees Siemens' strategic approach into the major municipal markets in the western part of the US. Uh, Dennis is passionate about driving thought leadership and innovation into cities with a focus on the built environment, uh, energy, mobility, and the internet of things. Um, he helped champion Siemens' solutions across a wide spectrum of infrastructure, and uh, he's probably going to elaborate a little bit on that during, uh, during his uh, uh, statements. So, Dennis, uh, I'd like to ask you to unmute yourself and, uh, uh, yeah, start with your statement. But before <laughs> I do that, <laughs> I'd like to encourage the others, uh, the different participants, to, if you have questions, don't hesitate to put them in the chat, or later on we have definitely time to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question in person. Uh, but already think of your questions. and. Uh, Dennis, right now, yeah. it's yours. Thanks, John. Can you hear me okay? We do hear you okay. Thank you. Okay. Can you see my slide deck okay? That's, yeah, they're, they're very well visible. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So I do realize that um, uh, outside of the question and answers, I'm the last person between uh, the Netherlands and dinner. So I'll, I'll try to make this a little bit quick in terms of kind of going through the, the slide deck. But I, I really appreciate um, the invitation to speak today. And I think you know, in one of the uh, previous two speakers, there's so much content to uh, uncover and talk about. And, you know, it's exciting to hear that the Netherlands may put in a petition for the 2000, 2032 Olympics. Um, I can only, you know, say from a personal experience, I used to work for the city of Los Angeles for a long time. Uh, and we looked at, you know, different Olympic uh, bids for a variety of time. It's, it's well worth it. Um, there is a huge kind of push if you have existing infrastructure in place. And it sounds like Casey Wasserman kind of mentioned that on yesterday's phone call. If, if there's structures in place and you don't have to do a lot of economic buildup, there's a huge benefit from, you know, kind of going through that process and the tourism and everything that comes with it. It's, it's you know, it's a, it's a big benefit. But um, for today's uh, quick presentation on my side, I was asked to talk about our city performance tool, which is um, a Siemens analytical tool that we've deployed around the world. Uh, in, in all uh, kind of candidness, we've, we've, you know, phased it out to a certain extent. It, it, it ran through about 40 different cities throughout the globe, uh, including Los Angeles, including San Francisco. And at this point in time, um, you know, we're looking at recent past uh, reports, which includes this report. I'm going to kind of go through real quickly with Los Angeles uh, from 2018. So again, my name is Dennis Rodriguez. I'm the head of external affairs for the Western United States for Siemens uh, Corporation here in the United States. 
Uh, I've been in this position since 2012. Um, prior to joining Siemens, I worked for the city of Los Angeles, um, I guess for nine years from 2003 to 2012. And I uh, worked for an elected official and um, had a fantastic time and, and kind of, you know, eventually transitioned into the private sector. So the, the quick and dirty on the city performance tool is that this is really an infrastructure blueprint um, tool that we use for different cities around the world. As I mentioned a second ago, uh, we deployed it in I think about 40 plus cities around the globe. So Asia, uh, India, Europe, United States, Latin America, <clears throat> you know, um, most of the major cities. I did check to see if we uh, utilize this in Amsterdam and the, and the short answer is we did not. Uh, I was hoping we did, so I can kind of talk to that. But what we're trying to do here is is really um, identify how the city, any city, can use technology to obtain short term short short term greenhouse gas re reduction emissions goals. And if you think about this, this is really <clears throat> tantamount to um, what it means to be a smart city. So if you if you look at your greenhouse gas emissions, and then you look at what technologies can improve that, you're really talking about how do you develop into a smart city? Is that infrastructure 4.0? Is it transportation, electrification? What's, you know, what are the aspects that kind of uh, push you in the direction of cleaning up your city and making it um, efficient and uh, clean for its residents? So this all, in my opinion, this all kind of ties into what's happening with the Olympics. Um, the world stage will be in Los Angeles in 2028, and you're you're really inviting the world to come to your doorstep. And so, from an LA perspective, you know this includes um, building out your metro system and making your air airport friendly and making your squat, um, skies clean and and that sort of thing. So it it all, you know, in my estimation, I think this all kind of ties in together. Um, real quick on the city performance tool, we looked at four different major sectors: industry, energy, buildings, and transport. For the purpose of this, this presentation, I'll focus on transport, but what we try to do is input as many publicly available data endpoints into the process. <clears throat> we analyze and crunch it and uh, cast it against 70 different technology levers that, that make sense from our perspective, uh, including things that have nothing to do with you know, Siemens technology. And the output, as I mentioned, is, a, is an infrastructure blueprint for the city. So we, so we did the Los Angeles uh, city performance tool um, under the direction of Mayor Garcetti, Eric, Eric Garcetti from the Mayor of Los Angeles. And so his sustainability office kind of uh, worked with us to, you know, kind of uh, put this process in place as it relates to Los Angeles. So for LA, we collected 350 different data points. We looked at um, 12 different regional planning documents, which, you know, if you're uh, anything to do with the planning world, this is kind of the bread and butter of how you look at what's happening from a regional perspective. We talked to a dozen plus different agencies and we actually had a board of directors of about 50 plus um, stakeholders. So just to take a quick deep dive into transportation, uh, as everybody know, knows, Los Angeles is the car capital of, of the United States, if not the world. So 86% of passenger miles in Los Angeles are traveled by uh, vehicle. Um, if you look at the twin ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach uh, here in Southern California, they import about 40% of um, uh, imported products come through the twin ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles. There's 11,000 truck trips that are a result of that. And so it's just heavy greenhouse uh, gas activity. The metro trains uh, run at headways of 12 minutes, which is not the average if you look across uh, the landscape across the world. And what does that mean for the future? So we're looking at uh, potentially adding new, uh, nine new metro um, uh, lines to the metro system here in LA. We're also trying to get the headways down to, uh, down to six minutes. We're looking at um, impacting the e-mobility market by up to 100% electric vehicles and, and car sharing. And um, we're looking at electric cargo, uh, e-highway uh, aspects. We're also looking at um, potentially charging for road space. I mean, this is a, a little bit of a political issue and it's been kind of kicking around for a long time, but uh, congestion charging in downtown Los Angeles has, you know, has certainly kind of popped up in recent times. And I think different cities are, are looking at this from, from their aspects. The future of Los Angeles, if you look at the different infrastructure outputs here, 
this is what it means from a greenhouse gas reductions emissions perspective. This is also what it means from a job creation perspective. Um, clearly, if you develop new uh, light rail transit systems and you've got nine new systems, <clears throat> that's going to have the biggest impact from a job creation perspective. E-sharing is also a heavy impact. Electric vehicles is also a heavy impact. Conversely, these also have um, you know disparate impacts on the on the greenhouse gas emissions, which you know uh, any big city in the world is is really trying to clean up their air quality and and make sure they've got uh, a reduction in greenhouse gases you know from this point forward. So the, the tagline and the headline from this report, I think, is that if you go through this whole process and you put all these um, chargers and electric buses and car sharing into place, what you're going to see is a, a basically a 1,663% increase in the electrical consumption based on today's electrical consumption into the future. So let me, <clears throat> let me just say that one more time. 1,663% electrical consumption increase from today's electrical consumption just based on e-mobility. So that's a huge impact. And I think it kind of necessitates that, you know, not only is e-transportation around the corner, uh, but you've also got to clean up the electrical grid and you've also got to focus on grid modernization. So those are, you know, major components of the um, infrastructure landscape that require attention at this point. So last couple slides here, how do you get to 60% greenhouse reduction by 2035 and 80% by 2050? Um, and what we identified is that you can look at some of these different technologies. I think if you look at electrical decarbonization and grid modernization, modernization by 2035, that has a huge impact on greenhouse emissions. The right-hand column kind of indicates uh, the reduction in the percentage, the capital requirement uh, capital investment that's required at this point, it's um, 113 billion. And, you know, the most important thing here is what kind of jobs does this create? <clears throat> so by 2035, if you make this investment uh, in Los Angeles, you're looking at up to 620,000 uh, new full-time jobs uh, that will be created. 2050 is a little different landscape. Um, You've got larger uh, CO2 reductions and uh, CO2 equivalent uh, based on 1990 level reductions. It requires a larger capital investment, but it also outputs um, a much uh, larger um, job equivalency in terms of 1.8 uh, million new jobs that will be created as a part of this you know, basic capital program. So um, this is a report that we did for the city of LA in 2018 and we, we kind of I uh, walked through this with the mayor's office um, at that time, and it was it was very well received. And I think some of these uh, technology choices are kind of being implemented at this point. Um, and that's um, that's kind of the, the the gist of the report. And I think um, Jan, I'll turn it back to you at this point. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Very informative, and um, it's good to get like a little bit of insight in these um, performance tools you guys uh, yeah, use to evaluate the different performances in city of LA. And yeah, the fact that you mentioned that greenhouse gases should definitely be one of the goals to make and work towards a more sustainable and healthy and smart city. Um, we're having some questions in the, uh, in the chat and let me quickly go through these questions. Um, let's start with a question from Africa. Uh, and that has been part, partially answered, answered by Jean already. Uh, but Africa's question is about where do you see the similarities between your cities? And this question is referred to Jean and Le Leonie. How can your cities and their respective companies work together? Uh, Jean, you already put an answer in the chat, but maybe you would like to elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, sure. So I, what I had responded was just that, you know, cities share so much, uh, so, so many similar opportunities and challenges. Um, each city has a little bit of different infrastructure. I think one of the areas that uh, that private sector plays in our role in, pre in preparation for the Olympics, but also just our role in, in kind of the future of smart cities is 5G and telecommunications companies have been instrumental and um, we've had an oddly good relationship with them <laughs> in building equitable uh, infrastructure across Los Angeles. We're the first 5G city in the Western hemisphere. And then um, the idea of sort of how we're deploying some of the transportation infrastructure, I, I think um, 
Dennis mentioned quite a bit of that as well. Uh, but also the idea of financial and data companies um, are part of it. So the way in which um, we talk about, uh, like Leone was talking about, you know, ethics and how we manage data appropriately. I think those are things that um, cities can work together on because people move all the time. And they, they somebody coming from a GP, GDPR uh, country in the U EU will have some expectations of how their data is handled in the US. And I think the more we collaborate, even if our um, elected officials don't always agree, the more we collaborate on infrastructure and standards, I think the better it'll be for an experience as people move around. Thank you, Jean. Yeah, maybe maybe you'd like to follow up as well, yeah. Yeah, no, I totally agree, because uh, uh, the cities are very different, uh, at least Amsterdam from LA, totally different scope. and. Uh, we are m moving mostly by bike and not by car, but still, if I zoom out from Amsterdam and I take it to the region, uh, so that's why I don't want to be Amsterdam smart city, but uh, focus on the region, then already we become closer and more similar. Uh, and we can learn a lot from, from the scope and scale uh, LA is addressing. Uh, so I totally agree with you about having this cooperation with uh, private companies, also this cooperation between different governments. Uh, within a region, uh, local government and, and, and sub-local. And one of the things that struck me from the presentation from Dennis is this electrification of, uh, of vehicles, which is huge uh, here in the Netherlands as, as, as well. We don't have enough space in the city of Amsterdam to build enough uh, charging poles and, and enough stations to collect for all this um, uh, energy. And even we will not have, and Ruben uh, from Circularity will know about it as well, we will not have enough raw materials to even produce all these electrical cars. So we have to uh, think smarter than just a switch from fossil to, to electrical uh, all over the world. So we have to sharing, uh, have shared cars, smaller cars, and we think of how uh, this electricity is going to be produced and shared. And I think so apart from ethics, uh, this, this shifting from fossil to electrical, how to do this in, in a wise way, uh, I, I guess we are all in this together. And I, I would love to learn from also Siemens what you have collected on that. And, and Jan, I'll just um, quickly add that. I think um, that's a great point. And the reality is that as we move into the e-mobility space, we also have to focus on our grid modernization um, in our power generation. So in the United States, we um, capture most of our energy power generation from, you know, coal producing power plants. And so, at, you know, you, you shift towards um, transportation electrification, but if you're still picking up your power generation from sources that are not clean and renewable, you know, what does that mean? So we're, we're slowly working off that. And I think um, uh, the mayor of Los Angeles, Mayor Garcetti has um, done an incredible job in kind of leading that conversation. And he's, he's um, decided to shift away from, you know, dirty fossil um, burning fuel sources for power generation. And that's, you know, that's at the forefront of what's the conversation is taking place in the United States. But you can't just say we're going to move towards electric transportation and not focus on the power generation side of it. It's got to be, it's got to be hand in hand. Yeah, hopefully your answer is, uh, is, 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 is uh, your question is being answered in Africa and uh, uh, there were- Pretty much all water. of you. Uh, very Definitely. good, thank you. Uh, let's quickly uh, 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 jump to the next question uh, before we have to wrap up because I see that we already have like, uh, yeah, only like a few minutes left. Uh, that question is from, uh, from Ruben and he is addressing a question to Dennis. Um, does sustainability change the business model of Siemens? Um, for example, designing projects to be reused or to be kept in a loop longer. Is that, is that something you could elaborate on a little bit? Yeah, just in brief, it's, it doesn't change it in, in, what, in any, um, any narrow aspect. Um, I think if you talk to the company leadership at Siemens, they'll tell you that sustainability has been a focus point for us, you know, not just from a product perspective, but also from a holistic perspective. If you're talking about smart cities, you know, what does that mean from a sustainability aspect? And that's, you know, kind of, um, falls in line with our city performance tool. Sustainability has been at the forefront of all of our conversations for the past 15 years. So if it means designing a better product or designing a city to, you know, um, have a longer trail when it comes to, you know, just um, being more effective, I, I think that's, that's right at the top of our discussion points. 
Very good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dennis. And um, um, yeah, I see. Uh, I, yes, somebody puts like uh, the, 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 the Zoom link for the next meeting already in the chat. <laughs> so it means that we have to wrap up. Um, but all the <laughs> all the contact details uh, for, uh, from the different panelists are uh, in the chat. Uh, I believe Jean and also Leonie and Dennis put their contact details in it. So if you have like further questions, there's definitely room to follow up later. Um, let me close off with thanking you so much for uh, participating and elaborating a little bit on your uh, perspective with regard to uh, uh, yeah, the smart city approach and also the different tools you guys are using and, and how that helps to um, bring, uh, 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 yeah, to improve uh, actually the processes in, in cities. Uh, we've talked a lot about transportation and definitely transportation will definitely be, yeah, uh, an, an, an important issue to address uh, um, anticipating the LA 2028 games. And, uh, uh, and that would be, yeah, that, yeah, it would be a very interesting topic to uh, to discuss that more in into detail, uh, in, in like in other occasions. Um, having said that, I'd like to thank you so much, Jean, for participating, Leonie and Dennis, and and giving your thoughts and and and, and at least uh, 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 your your answers to a few questions. And uh, we will we will be in touch to. Uh, um, to, to, to discuss further and to keep on uh, to keep on continuing the conversation with you guys. So so thank you so much, and uh, the links to the next session are in the group chat. And the next session is about matchmaking. And I believe every single company already got assigned a uh, group they have to uh, 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 move towards, and, and and they will be yeah like having a short discussion with the different uh, um, uh, yeah companies they they are assigned to. So thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye.